Welcome to this video on adding and subtracting waveforms using phasor diagrams. In our previous video, we looked at how we can add and subtract waveforms using software such as Microsoft Excel. And what we did was we took the instantaneous values of those waveforms and added them or subtracted them from one another to produce new waveforms. If you haven't seen that video, I recommend going back to watch that video first. But in this video, we're actually going to take the same two waveforms. I've got here two voltage uh, waveforms, AC voltages, V1 and V2. And they're the same uh, formulae for these two waveforms as in our previous video. And what we're going to do in this video is use a different method, uh, using phasor diagrams in this case. But hopefully, we're going to get the same results. So first of all, what is a phasor diagram? Well, the simplest explanation is that a phasor is another word for a vector or an arrow. And what we're going to do in our phasor diagram is represent our waveforms. Rather than plotting graphs of sinusoids, we're going to draw arrows or vectors instead. And these vectors are going to show us the same properties that we would see on a fully plotted graph. Now, it's much easier to draw an arrow or a vector than it is to actually plot a graph out in full. And so what we find is using this method often makes the process of adding or subtracting waveforms a little bit easier, especially if we don't have software such as Microsoft Excel to hand to plot graphs out in full. Let's go back to our two waveforms for a moment, V1 and V2. Just like in our last video, the elements of this formula that we're concerned about are first of all the amplitudes of our two sine waves, in this case 10 and 5, and also any phase shifts that we encounter in our waveforms. In this case, we see a phase shift of minus 30 degrees in V2. These parameters are going to be represented in our phasor diagram when we come to draw it. So how do we draw a phasor? Well, like we said before, a phasor is very simply just an arrow. And an arrow has a length, and it also has a direction. Now, in our case, the length of the arrow is going to be determined by the amplitude of our waveform. So V1 would have a length of 10. V2 would have a length of 5. It's important to point out here that I don't necessarily mean 10 centimetres or 10 millimetres. The scale doesn't matter, but rather that we have these two waveforms to scale with one another. So V1, regardless of what scale we use, will have a, a phasor or an arrow that is twice the length of V2. The second thing that we said we were going to consider was this phase shift. By default, we should imagine that the phases in our diagram should point to the right, like so. If our waveform has a negative phase shift, it should tilt downwards from the horizontal. Likewise, if our waveform has a positive phase shift, it should tilt upwards from the horizontal. So by putting this into practice, we're going to have a go at constructing the phasor diagram to show V1 and V2. Here's my first vector or phasor for V1. First of all, we can see that because V1 has an amplitude of 10, I've reflected that in my diagram by having the vector have a length of 10. Secondly, V1 doesn't have a phase shift, either positive or negative. And so, by default, V1 should sit on the horizontal. Now I've added my second phasor for V2. We notice that V2 only has an amplitude of 5, and so, likewise, the length of V2 is 5. We also notice that V2 has a phase shift of minus 30 degrees. And what we said before 
was that a negative phase shift is a downwards tilt from the horizontal. And so we see here that we have a 30 degree tilt downwards for V2 from the horizontal. Now that we've constructed our phaser diagram, we can start to think how, first of all, we might add these two vectors together. One thing that we can do if we've drawn this diagram very, very accurately and the angles and the lengths are all perfectly to scale is we can set up a parallelogram-like arrangement by adding two parallel sides to our diagram, like so. The positioning of this parallelogram arrangement takes us to the position of the addition of V1 and V2. So in this case, adding together V1 and V2 would give us a resultant vector that would look like this. This new vector, V1 plus V2, also has a length and it also has an angle. And we always measure the angle from the horizontal. But the length and the angle are unknown to us. If we've drawn our diagram perfectly, and mine is by no means perfect, but if we've perfectly drawn the lengths and the angles and so forth, then we could actually measure the length and measure the angle on the page and get a pretty good idea of the resultant V1 plus V2. In this case, though, we're not going to do that. We haven't drawn a perfect diagram here. And we're going to use trigonometry to try and calculate the length of V1 plus V2 and also the angle here that V1 plus v V2 is from the horizontal. To do this, we're going to use trigonometry to break down our vectors into horizontal and vertical components. We're not allowed any diagonals anymore and we're just going to express things as horizontals and verticals. So first of all, let's look at V1. V1 has a horizontal component, but it has no vertical component. It's only moving in a horizontal direction. So for V1, I can say that its horizontal component is 10. Its vertical component is zero. For V2, however, things are a little bit more complicated. V2 is a vector at an angle of 30 degrees. And so we can think of it as having a horizontal and a vertical component. Let's try and visualize that on our diagram here. V2, we can imagine as going along a certain distance and then down a certain distance to get to the point where the vector ends. And so the horizontal and the vertical component there are the lengths that we need to find. Now we don't know these lengths and we're going to have to use trigonometry to find them. Let's have a look at this triangle that we've made in a little bit more detail. We know that it's a right angle triangle first of all, I'll mark that on there. We also know the hypotenuse, or the longest side of that triangle, is 5. We know as well that we have a marked angle here of 30 degrees. So this means that we can mark on two sides to our triangle, the adjacent, which is the side adjacent or next to the marked angle, and the opposite, which is the side that's opposite the marked angle. If we can find the adjacent, then we've calculated the horizontal component of our vector. And if we can find the opposite, we've calculated the vertical component of our vector. So we're going to use two trigonometric identities to do this. The first of which is to say that the adjacent is equal to the hypotenuse multiplied by cos of the angle. The second one is to say that the opposite is equal to the hypotenuse times the sine of the angle. So let's put both of these into practice here. We can say, first of all, that the adjacent, being the hypotenuse, which we know to be 5, multiplied by cos of the angle, and we know the angle to be 30. So our adjacent is equal to 5 times cos 30 
And using a calculator, I get that answer to be 4.33. Likewise, with our formula for the opposite, the hypotenuse times sine of the angle, again, we can see that that's 5 times sine of 30, which gives me an answer of 2.5. One word of caution is, if you're using a scientific calculator to calculate these results here, make sure that it's set to degrees. Now that we've calculated the sides of our triangle here, we can return to V2 and we can state its horizontal and its vertical components. First of all, its horizontal component is going to be 4.33. Its vertical component, we calculate it to be 2.5, but remember that it's traveling downwards by a distance of 2.5. And so, Really, we should say minus 2.5. Likewise, if any of our horizontal components were traveling to the left rather than to the right, they would be minus as well. So finally, now that we have our horizontal components for both V1 and V2, and we have our vertical components for V1 and V2 as well, we can calculate a total horizontal component and a total vertical component. So in this case, we can say that our total horizontal is going to be 10 plus 4.33, which gives me a total of 14.33. Likewise, I can calculate the total vertical component, which is 0 plus minus 2.5, which is going to give me minus 2.5. At this point, let's refer back to our original diagram, where we'd constructed this third vector, v1 plus v2. And what we've said now is, even if we don't know the length of v1 plus v2, and we don't know the angle that v1 plus v2 is at, we have calculated that it has a horizontal component, so I'll just mark that on here, and it has a vertical component. We also know that the horizontal component has a value of 14.33, and we know that the vertical component here has a value of minus 2.5. So, finally, we can use these horizontal and vertical components to determine the length of the vector v1 plus v2. And we can do this by using Pythagoras' theorem. We know that again, this is a right angle triangle. And so because we know that, we can use Pythagoras' theorem, a squared equals b squared plus c squared. Or in this case, the hypotenuse squared equals 14.33 squared plus minus 2.5 squared. It's important to remember that when we square a minus number, it becomes a positive number. But that being said, when I calculate 14.33 squared plus minus 2.5 squared, I get an answer of 211.5989. Now, remember, we've calculated the hypotenuse squared here, and so I'll need to square root that answer in order to get the correct result. And in this case, we'll find that the hypotenuse of this new vector is equal to 14.55. I'll mark that on my diagram as well here. We've worked out the length of our new vector, but we haven't worked out its angle, the angle that it dips from the horizontal here. We can do this using another trigonometric identity, which is to say the tan of the angle equals the opposite over the adjacent. Let's have a look back at our diagram here because 
our marked angle is going to be this angle here that we don't know. The opposite, in this case, is going to be our vertical component. The adjacent is going to be our horizontal component. And so we can say tan theta equals minus 2.5 over 14.33. We don't want to know tan of the angle. We just want to know the angle. And so a final rearrangement of this formula would look like this. Theta, the angle, equals tan to the minus 1 of minus 2.5 over 14.33. And calculating that gives me an angle of minus 9.90 degrees. And so that's going to be our angle here. So now that we've calculated the length and the angle of our new vector v1 plus v2, the last thing we can do is we can write it out as a proper formula, much like we saw the form v1 and v2 take at the start of this example. We can say that v1 plus v2 is equal to 14.55 sine omega t minus 9.90. So that brings us to the end of part one of this video on adding and subtracting two waveforms using phasor diagrams. In this video, we've added these two waveforms together, V1 and V2. But in part two, we'll look at how we can subtract these waveforms from one another. Thank you.